What's up YouTube? Today I'm going to be doing some Anki cards together with you and that will just give you an idea of what my cards look like and a little bit of my process of how I like to create my cards. Uh, mainly uh, a lot of these cards I've been making recently for my boards preparation and so a lot of these new cards that we're going to be going through today, uh, these 43 new ones, are questions that I either got wrong or when I was reviewing things in the textbooks, uh, things that I wanted to add in. So let's get into doing this and just uh, just and see see what happens so uh we're going to start right now avnrt can cause retrograde p waves and or what finding in lead v1 the answer to that's going to be a pseudo r prime uh, is fludrocortisone required in patients with secondary adrenal insufficiency from prednisone use the answer is no uh, mineralocorticoid replacement is only required for primary adrenal insufficiency so if you see you know when I, a lot of my cards here Honestly, a lot of them nowadays are just like yes or no answers, and it just kind of helps me like organize information, but also just makes the card really easy to do um, and make sure that you actually know if you got the card right or, or not. Uh, what are the three initial screening tests for Cushing syndrome? So that's going to be a late night salivary cortisol, a 24 hour urine collection, and a one milligram dexamethasone suppression test. If two of them are positive, then you'll check an ACTH, and if that's high, then you'll check an eight milligram dexamethasone suppression. Uh, is lumbar puncture uh, to evaluate CSF for oligoclonal bands useful for diagnosing MS? The answer is no. So a lot, all of these are just kind of bringing back questions that I got wrong. So, uh, you know, this was a question that I was uh, trying to diagnose a patient with uh, MS uh, on the board question. And one of the answers was lumbar puncture to look for oligoclonal bands. But the other one was just getting an MRI brain straight up. And so uh, this basically is a reminder every time that, uh, you know, that's not really a useful test to get. Uh, should an adrenal mass greater than four centimeters with negative testing for Cushing's or pheochromocytoma be referred for adrenalectomy? The answer is yes. So these are some of the concerning findings for malignancy. And for me, I, I thought it was a non-functioning tumor, so maybe they could just observe it. But uh, actually, these should be uh, uh, referred for removal as well. Uh, what condition causes bone pain or fracture in setting of chronically low vitamin D levels? That's going to be uh, osteomalacia. Uh, so you see low vitamin D, calcium, phosphate, elevated PTH, and alkaline phosphatase, which is differentiated from osteitis fibrosis cystica, which is usually uh, seen in CKD patients from abnormally high bone turnover from prolonged exposure to PTH. Um, and so we can just edit this right now just to fix some of the typos. And we'll move on. Do patients need to discontinue aspirin prior to colonoscopy with possible polypectomy? The answer is no. 2016 AGA guidelines recommend continuing aspirin for secondary cardiovascular prophylaxis before and after polypectomy. What is the initial treatment for sicka symptoms? That's going to be uh, artificial tears and sugar-free candies. The immediate treatment goal is reestablishing re the wetting of the eyes and the mouth, not doing immunosuppression or methotrexate or things like that, unless there's severe joint disease. Should anticoagulation or antiplatelet medications be started in a patient with a mechanical aortic valve in the absence of atrial fibrillation? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, warfarin and aspirin should both be started. I actually need to double check on this because it still sounded a little bit weird to me, but let's see. Actually, okay, so the need, yeah, because I, I knew that, you know, mitral valves were a higher risk of clotting off, but uh, in this case, uh, the answer was that both should be started, warfarin and aspirin. Uh, chondral calcinosis in the joints on radiography suggests what disease? That's going to be calcium pyrophosphate arthropathy. Uh, treatment is with low-dose prednisone and cesarecolchicine, just like gout. Condition that can cause a rash with multiple red papules or vesicles in the setting of fever. Um, this one, I actually can't quite remember. Uh, it's called miliaria, aka heat rash, due to the occlusion of eccrine sweat ducts. Um, and you can get this miliaria crystallina and miliaria rubra when it's a little bit deeper. So we'll do that one again. What infection can cause a ring form or mal Maltese cross tetrad on blood smear? That's going to be babesiosis. Uh, I remember the ring forms in your erythrocytes kind of indicate babesia or malaria. But for this question particularly, I only remember the malaria part. And so I uh, didn't get that part right. What is one reason chlorothaladone is preferred uh, over hydrochlorothiazide? It's thought to have a longer duration of action, which improves 24-hour blood pressure control. Uh, 
and there's some studies that show superiority, but there's a greater risk of adverse events. And the actual benefit of cardiovascular outcomes is not clear. I was actually planning to maybe make a short video on this um, in the next few days. What is one reason chlorothaladone is preferred? Can colchicine cause rhabdo, AKI, and pancytopenia? The answer is yes, especially if you co-administer it with CYP inhibitors uh, because you get this colchicine toxicity, most notably with clarithromycin. Why can TNF-alpha inhibitors lose efficacy over time? It's because the body forms anti-drug antibodies. Um, and then here's just a list of all the TNF-alpha inhibitors because for me, sometimes I struggled remembering uh, which medications were all uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors because they all have different endings. You know how like beta blockers, they all end in L in LOL or, um, you know, lysinopril or uh, sucubitril or whatever they all, or sorry, um, or sorry, any of the like ACE inhibitors, like lysinopril, uh, or, uh, wow. I can't think of any other ACE inhibitors right now. Other ACE inhibitors, <laughs> uh, benazapril, captopril. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they, uh, they all have like the same ending, but you know, TNF alpha inhibitors don't. So this was from the mix app book. I just took a screenshot and put it in here. Uh, should lip biopsy be considered in patients with an inconclusive diagnosis of Sjogren's? The answer is yes. Um, here's some of the criteria for making the diagnosis. Should a patient with newly diagnosed pernicious anemia be evaluated with upper endoscopy? The answer is yes to evaluate for gastric adenocarcinoma and gastric carcinoid. TNF-alpha is secreted by what cell in joints? This is the fibroblast. And this is just because I wanted to kind of understand the mechanism of how TNF-alpha actually improves joint disease in a lot of these autoimmune conditions. And basically, you have these synovial fibroblasts that secrete TNF-alpha, and it causes uh, activation of neutrophils and chondrocytes, and they release these matrix metalloproteins, and all these things lead to like, lots of inflammation. So then you bring in these TNF-alpha inhibitors, and it kind of blunts off a lot of that inflammation. So that's how it's working. Does taking levothyroxine with coffee reduce absorption? The answer is yes. Some other things to know is that calcium and ferrous sulfate reduce absorption by 25% and should be separated by four hours. And levothyroxine should be taken 60 minutes before food or coffee is consumed. Should initiation of outpatient dialysis be delayed until uremic symptoms appear if GFR is above seven? Um, should outpatient... Uh, Yes. So um, basically, there's no benefit to starting dialysis early. So really, they just start it if GFR is below seven or if uremic symptoms start. And there's this study in 2010 that kind of showed it's kind of prolong this approach kind of prolongs uh, the amount of dialysis free time a patient can have, which improves their quality of life a lot. What is the most common early manifestation of systemic sclerosis, Raynaud phenomenon? If a patient does not have Raynaud phenomenon, it is very unlikely that they have systemic sclerosis. Patient has severe shoulder and upper extremity pain, followed by progressive weakness and resolution of the pain. Um, this one, I don't remember. Oh, idiopathic brachial plexopathy, um, commonly triggered by preceding infection or surgery. Okay. When is belimumab indicated in patients with lupus? Uh, this is for moderate to severe di disease. That's not, you know, controlled on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the other two options are MMF or azathioprine. And then mainly cyclophosphamide should be reserved for severe or life-threatening disease. When is the earliest you can discontinue Plavix in a stentin patient's DAPT if they need urgent surgery? Um, so say somebody had like a cancer and they needed that removed, but they just got like a stent a few months ago. So the earliest you can discontinue the plavix is actually three months. Um, if there is risk of surgical delay, um, then yeah, three months. Uh, and then here's just some other guidelines for when you can discontinue the DAPT for other conditions. Pregnant women with anti-Rho and LA are at increased risk for what? That's going to be neonatal lupus erythematosus, which is characterized by rash and congenital heart block. Should dexamethasone be added to ripe therapy in patients with suspected tuberculous meningitis? The answer is yes. What, what biologic may be preferred for RA patients with a history of severe infection? That's going to be uh, abatacept. And this is not something that, you know, I'm not going to be prescribing you abatacept. But for me, I feel like as a hospitalist, it's just helpful to know, like, why is this patient on abatacept? And like, why are they on rituximab or tocilizumab instead? Um, I do think knowing that kind of stuff is helpful for me, or at least I'm curious uh, you know, into information like that. 
Uh, how does the presentation of atypical HUS differ from typical HUS? So atypical HUS tends to be more insidious and is not always associated with diarrhea. The distinction is important as atypical can be effectively treated with equiluzumab. Should a patient with recurrent unilateral epistaxis be referred for nasal endoscopy? The answer is yes, as this may be a sign of neoplasm. Should patients with symptomatic claudication attempt celostazole prior to referral for surgical revascularization? The answer is yes. So these are the things, smoking cessation, exercise training, and medical therapy. If no improvement, then you should refer for invasive management. Be careful for the black box black box warning on the use of celostazole for heart failure. Should nephrology be consulted before placing PICs in patients with CKD3? Apparently, per the American Society of Nephrology recommendations, they should always be consulted for this. Uh, in practice, at our institution, they pretty much just don't place PICs in patients with CKD3 uh, or above. What is the primary safety concern with TNF-alpha inhibitors? It's going to be infection, especially risk of tuberculosis. How is malt lymphoma associated with H. pylori infection treated? Um, just treating the H. pylori. Uh, you don't do anything specifically for the malt lymphoma, and it should regress slowly over time. Next step in management for a patient with signs and symptoms of severe aortic stenosis, but only moderate stenosis on echo. Um, this patient probably needs uh, a cath. Uh, yes, so cath to really dis distinguish if they truly have severe AS or not. Uh, because the echo might not be not accurate. What does the Shermer test evaluate for? That's going to be for tear production, uh, which is used in the evaluation of like Sjogren's syndrome or Sika symptoms. Should a patient with presumed cardioembolic stroke uh, receive aspirin or heparin? Um, this is going to be aspirin. Uh, this was a really tricky question just because, you know, they kept talking about the patient's AFib and they made it really obvious that you know, this person probably had like an AFib that embolized, uh, but even still uh, the treatment's aspirin. Anti-ribosomal P is associated with what lupus complications? That's going to be CNS lupus and lupus hepatitis. Um, it's only seen 15% of the time uh, for SLE in general. Back pain that improves with exercise is characteristic of inflammatory back pain. Um, these are all different things that are uh, associated with inflammatory back pain, um, which could be from things like ankylosing spondylitis, as opposed to, you know, arthritis, which does not have back pain that improves with exercise. How does hydroxychloroquine work? It's kind of unclear uh, how the mechanism works, uh, but it's thought to stabilize lysosomal vacuoles, uh, which interferes with some of the antigen processing to uh, your antigen presenting cells and all the T cells and things like that, which leads to decreased autoimmune and you know, you know, autoimmune problems attacking your own body. Should a patient with candidemia be initially treated with an echinocandin or fluconazole? The answer should be an echinocandin, for example, anigilofungin, uh, caspofungin, or mycofungin, um, due to some candida species having intrinsic resistance to azoles. Should statins be discontinued prior to pregnancy? The answer is yes. Uh, condition causing back pain with bridging vertical syndesmosphites, um, often more prominent on the right side, is going to be this condition I never heard about until I read the rheumatology textbook, but uh, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Um, so you'll see like all this calcification on the right side of the thoracic spine. Uh, what is the indication for uh, evabrodrine in patients with HEFREF? Uh, heart rate greater than 70. So there was this 2010 shift study which showed that uh, in patients with max beta blocker therapy and continued uh, heart rate of greater than 70, uh, it reduces mortality and heart failure hospitalization. Should all patients with bi bicuspid aortic valve undergo CT angiography to evaluate the, the aorta? Uh, the answer to this one is um, yes, they should. Uh, bicu bicuspid valves are commonly associated with aortic abnorm abnormalities, so all patients should be uh, uh, assessed for possible aortopathy. All right, now these are going into some of my older uh, questions. You can see we've kind of gone through all the uh, new questions. So this one, I believe, is Ober's test, where you pull back and try and drop it. And this looks for iliotibial band problems. Description of shortness of breath in hepatopulmonary syndrome is ortho orthodeoxia platypnea syndrome. So they improve with lying down and... Uh, uh, basically, yeah, they, they, all their symptoms get better when they're lying down. Um, platypnea, orthodeoxia. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, large hepatocytes with finely granular, homogeneous pale pink cytoplasms, probably alcoholic. Uh, this kind of sounds like Kimmel Steel, uh, Mallory bodies. Okay, so it's chronic hepatitis B. Um, okay, we can see that in a year. <laughs> Cherry red appearance is going to be carb carbon monoxide yes carbon monoxide poisoning as opposed to cyanide which is going to be like gray blue fen fen is a drug for treating obesity um, but it's got a lot of really bad side effects so we don't try to give we really try to avoid giving this to people this is just something that you may have heard some patients being on which type of immunization has rapid onset that should be a passive immunization as opposed to live immunization Patient with mildly elevated LFTs, fatigue, joint pain, vesicular blisters on skin, it's probably hepatitis, um, or, or per, uh, this is probably porphyria cutanea tarda, or it's cryoglobulinemia associated with hepatitis C. So yeah, chronic hepatitis C. Oh, okay, so okay, it's per, porphyria cutanea tarda associated with hepatitis C, I believe. What does hyperthyroidism with high radioiodine uptake indicate? That indicates a lot of uh, autonomous production of, uh, of thyroid hormone. Uh, so low radioiodine uh, suggests inflammation and destruction of thyroid tissue or an extrathyroidal source of thyroid hormone. Why is it important to ask about nocturnal spontaneous erections in men with erectile dysfunction? So this is a common question that we'll ask men because um, if they're no longer having spontaneous erections, then that raises more concern for there being a vascular problem rather than just like some kind of psychological problem with n not being able to maintain an erection. So presence argues against, yeah, the presence of spontaneous erections argues against neurologic or vascular disease. What value of INR should you consider giving oral vitamin K to reverse warfarin? Uh, that should be greater than nine. Um, although usually we give IV vitamin K, I believe, but so greater five, greater than five, if there's an increased risk of bleeding or greater than nine. Otherwise, uh, these are some of the criteria that, you know, there's a lot of different numbers that people use for uh, reversing warfarin. Heinz bodies and G6PD deficiency are made up of nucleus remnants. Uh, sorry precipitated hemoglobin will subsequently get removed and result in bite cells. Uh, this is Zell syndrome, absent paroxysomes leading to hypotonia, seizures, hepatomegaly, and early death. Zell Weiger syndrome, sorry. What are clinical symptoms that may develop from polyarteritis nodosa? Um, you know, you get skin lesions, you get kidney disease, hypertension, uh, and some nerve changes. What is the potential negative outcome of intraductal papilloma? Uh, probably met metastatic cancer, right? Transformation into breast cancer, okay? One of the most commonly missed physical signs of endocarditis is eye finding. Um, should be conjunctival uh, hemorrhages or uh, pete petechial conjunctivitis, pet petechial conjunctival lesions. Scoring system for prognosticating upper GI bleed uh, for how dangerous this is going to be for, for you know, re-bleeding or whatever is going to be the Glas Glasgow Blatchford score. Score of zero can be discharged home. Score of one or less, no need for EGD. What fasting blood sugar value suggests diabetes? Um, it's greater than uh, 126. Okay. Uh, I was just getting confused with uh, of the fact that it was a fasting sugar, but it's, yeah, greater than 126. A significant effect of gancyclovir, um, which has increased incidence with co-administration of zidovudine or TMP-SMX, probably dress syndrome or neutropenia, so bone marrow suppression. So I uh, got that one wrong, so we will do that one again, as all of these are associated with bone marrow suppression. Mechanism, mechanism of action of cevelomer is a phosphate binder. In the GI tract, first step of patient with malignancy who develops back pain with motor slash sensory abnormalities and bladder dysfunction um, would be a CT scan. <laughs> oh, or a case. Yeah, yeah, steroids too, but yeah, you would get yeah, you would get some kind of imaging. MRI probably. 
Antidromic AVRT uh, has a wide QRS. This is AVRT that's going in like the opposite direction as it normally does. Um, and then a cranial nerve 12 lesion, tongue deviates towards the lesion. Uh, you can see there's a couple uh, 10 and 11 deviate away towards the lesion, um, away from the lesion, and then cranial nerve 5 and 12 deviate towards the lesion. Rickettsia prozeki is spread by ticks or lice. What pathologic process leads to problems with coronary luminal flow, release of nitric oxide? This is coronary artery disease. Lymphocytic uh, choreomeningitis virus is inactivated by heat and... Um, heat and acid and irradiation. Okay. I'm not really sure I need to know this anymore, but it's got a 9.4 year, uh, uh, interval. So let's just mark it as hard, I guess. A co-infection of what two diseases can cause diffuse large B cell lymphoma, probably HIV and EBV. Does carbon monoxide diffuse quickly or slowly through the alveolar membrane? Um, this is quickly, as opposed to oxygen, which has a bit of a slower uh, diffusion gradient. What sequence of syphilis testing is done at UC Davis? This is the reverse sequence testing. So we start with the uh, RPR, I believe. Let's see. We start with a non-treponemal screening test, um, like the RPR, and then we confirm with the TPPA. Um, let's see, I remember this was like a question that I got wrong, um, and is important to know. EIA false negatives are uncommon. Non-treponemal false negatives are more common. Note there can be a prozone effect that can occur. Um, when very high serum antibodies supersaturate and... Okay, so basically you start with the RPR and then if the RPR is positive, oh, you start with the treponemal test and then if that's positive, you get the RPR. If it's positive, you have a diagnosis of syphilis. If it's negative, then uh, you have to just, you know, then you have to do a, a more thorough history, I guess. Peripheral opacities on chest X-ray suggest what possible diagnoses? Um, that would be uh, um, COVID, CEP, and COP. These tend to be like more peripheral, although COVID can totally be central too. This is just a, something that I made a while ago trying to classify different kinds of diseases uh, based on their distribution. Condition that can cause a rash with multiple red papules or vesicles in the setting of fever. Um, that would be uh, uh, the miliaria, again, the heat rash. What heart sound is associated with dilated cardiomyopathy? That's going to be S3 for volume overload. Next step after detecting um, elevated blood capillary lead level uh, would be, um, I don't know. Confirmation with venous blood sample. Blood capillary lead level may not always be accurate. Okay, I'll mark that as wrong. This one is probably um, a a patellar tendon rupture because it seems like a high high riding patella. It's like much higher than it should be. So patellar tendon rupture. First step in management of a patient with likely PE uh, would be. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what I put in this question. It's either a CT scan or it's just anticoagulate. So it's probably just anticoagulate um, before diagnostic testing. So if you have a very high, so with, with very high suspicion for PE, then that makes it a little bit more clear for me for the future that I'm talking about anticoagulating before getting a CT. How does hyperthyroidism cause hypertension? Uh, probably just vasoconstriction because of release of cortisol or something. Oh, okay. Increased cardiac contractility. That makes sense too. Uh, not increased SVR, which is what I said, or increased production of catecholamines. Most important drug to prevent ventricular arrhythmias in a patient with chest pain would be amiodarone, right? Oh, beta, beta blocker. Okay. In a patient with chest pain. Yeah, they have active chest pain. Okay. Uh, acute systemic inflammatory response with multiple organ dysfunction after CAR-T therapy or bone marrow transplant is going to be um, 
cytokine release syndrome or CRS. This is due to activated T cells. For mild CRS, we do symptomatic treatment. For severe CRS, we do tocilizumab plus steroid. And for ICANS, uh, there's this neurotoxicity syndrome, um, which can occur with or without CRS. Earliest sign of magnesium toxicity should be hyperreflexia or hyporeflexia, sorry. Um, but you have to get to really, really high levels to get magnesium toxicity, like seven, eight, maybe even higher than that. Uh, a significant adverse effect of gancyclovir is neutropenia or bone marrow suppression. And that's it. So hopefully that gave you a quick look into uh, how I do some of my Anki cards. I know this was completely unedited and I really just went through this uh, really quickly. So not sure if this is helpful for you guys at all, but I was planning to stream and then my internet connection was just not good enough because it kept disconnecting. I'm using like a wireless transmitter right now, so I don't have a good stable wired connection. Um, but uh, hopefully this is helpful for you guys. And I hope you, uh, if you have any questions on how I make Anki cards or whatever, let me know, let me know down in the questions below. Let me know down in the comments below and I'll see you next time. Peace.